So today's Loose Cannon features one of the oldest, most iteration-y franchise character that didn't start in like a book or as an archetype or as a folk character, but from the movies. <laughs> is utterly of cinema, and while yeah, there are plenty of non-movie versions, there's a lot to take about how film form has changed over the years just by looking at the different versions of King Kong, like which symbol of man's hubris are we climbing today, or why is man the real monster this time, or the racism that never really seems to be handled better with each different incarnation. Anyway, given that this is also a character that tends not to get much in the way of, you know, dialogue or any dialogue, Kong is less a deep, nuanced character that changes a lot from version to version so much as a concept. If a theme can be a character, it's King Kong, and it, with it, his interactions with the kidnapped ladyfolk. <laughs> that, that aspect tends not to change too much. Even though Kong is supposed to be the monster of the piece, he's also the thing people remember and like and even kind of sympathize with. He's very similar to Godzilla in that way. And yes, we may look at Godzilla another day. Maybe. Maybe. In that the audience can't help but sympathize with the monster. Kong is usually an antagonist, but he's never the villain. So, while there are a bunch of versions of King Kong that are not movies, I'm going to stick just to movie versions for this particular episode because the legacy of Kong is so much of popular cinema and not just American cinema. So climb up your favorite monument to man's hubris and cuddle up with your favorite helpless kidnappy as we take a look at the history of King Kong. Did you ever hear of Kong? Gorillas are kind of the symbol of virility, which is funny because they have the smallest nards and lowest sex drives of all of the great apes, including us. Reason. But you know what? Whatever. It's a symbol of raw animal virility, not an actual, you know, one-to-one -one thing. Well, anyway, neither beast nor man. But this is relevant because the neither beast nor man aspect of King Kong tends to be sexualized when he's not actively appealing to children and sometimes when he is. We'll get to that. King Kong was born of the lost world genre of literature, popularized by the likes of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Basically, now that it's the 20th century and Europe and America have colonized all of Africa and half of Asia, those parts of the world aren't so mysterious and scary anymore, so the West is like, hey, let's make up new ones. Director Marion C. Cooper lived for the whole safari and exotic places thing, and King Kong was the brainchild inspired by his real life adventures. Not to mention some excitement about the Empire State Building, which had only recently finished being constructed. In terms of the film itself, Carl Denham is basically Cooper's self-insert character. King Kong is a simple movie, and a short movie. A film crew goes to an island to film a fantastic, mysterious thing, and halfway through they find the monster, and the monster becomes immediately smitten with the first white woman he ever sees. Yeah, blondes are scarce around here. The movie even sets up, like, a lady exchange rate. He's offering to trade six of his women for Anne. So six women of color on the Anne dollar today. Also, King Kong came out at this perfect time of when America was getting, like, really obsessed with monkeys. And that lasted for a while, like decades. This movie doesn't spend much time with Andero and King Kong. It's mostly just the adventures of the guys trying to get her back. Anne doesn't really even so much as pity Kong, but you know what? He doesn't really seem to care what she thinks. There is actually one point where he starts stripping off her clothes and tickling her. <laughs> And that's kind of an odd juxtaposition when they get back to New York and she's just really kind of blasé about engaging in Carl's really, really, really bad idea to put Kong on stage. Well, you know how Denham insisted. Of course, we had to come when he said it would help the show. Oh, I'll relive my trauma if you insist. King Kong starts with this quote, which sets up our theme. And I find that noteworthy because it's not an old Arabian proverb. It's not an old anything proverb. Cooper made it up. The Beauty and the Beast quote has this lofty, profound heft to it, and yet it isn't even a real quote. Like the legend of Kong within the context of the movie, we, the audience, take it for granted that sure, that's a thing. 
Kong is uncivilized masculinity, let's say. Uh, chaotic neutral, if you will. And beauty, in this case, belongs with uh, lawful neutral, or a civilized white guy. Civilized dish, you know, he says sailor. Which leads us to the statement that I'm not sure even the filmmakers were conscious they were making. It was beauty killed the beast. It's not beauty that kills the beast. It's colonialism. It's not that Kong wants Anne, and that's the problem. I mean, Jack wants her too, and you know, no problem there. It's that Anne tames Kong, and in the end, that deprives him of the self-preservation instinct that had been keeping him alive all this time. And given that Kong is somewhat humanized in this version, and even sexualized to some extent, there's always been this uh, uncomfortable racial subtext to basically the entire King Kong series. To quote uh, an old Mel Brooksian proverb, Hey, where are the white women at? It sounds kind of silly, but I'm sorry for it. So am I. But I've got a reason. For our holy shit, let's hastily crap out a quick cash in literally the very same year, we have Son of Kong. This one totally owns the concept of sympathetic Monster Kong who's your buddy. Aww. And it's... Well, at least it's short. Screenwriter Ruth Rose basically copped to the eh, why bother nature of this movie's existence. So this one is a lot goofier and less efforty and no symbols of man's hubris are climbed. No Anne Darrow or Jack Driscoll here. This one is about Denim and his flaccid white guilt. This it must be remorse or something. You see, I'm the guy that knocked out your pop with it. Once again, you know, Denim was always a bit of a self-insert Mary Sue, so it's not the best sequel, but it's not like there's nothing interesting here. At first, Carl is more torn up about the lawsuits than any, you know, horrors wrought or Kongs exploited. He appears to view the whole King Kong thing in the last movie as something of an oopsie daisy. Kong sure was a hoodoo for me. Carl meanders Skull Island words for a while, makes some friends, and then 30 minutes into a movie that is only an hour long, they decide to go back to Skull Island for reasons, and boom! Well, I never knew that old Kong had a son! <laughs> well, you know what? Good, good. I'm, I'm glad you didn't know that. And Denim and his new love interest are instantly sympathetic to little Kong. Unlike Anne, she's not much with the screaming and isn't afraid of the little guy. Well, you know, little. Carl's got some white guilt, so he helps the little Kong out, and then pats himself on the back for doing the barest possible minimum. Well, I know it sounds funny, but instead of shooting him, I helped him out of a jam. I felt I owed his family something. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, the island sinks. <laughs> Sorry, natives. The movie ends with Baby Kong holding Denim above the water long enough to be rescued, and then Baby Kong drowns. It has a weirdly tragic ending for such a goofy little movie. Because Denim learns the ways of his oopsie daisy, Son of Kong gives Denim and Englehorn the happy ending that they do not deserve. Poor little Kong. Kong family just can't catch a break. In 1963, with the Godzilla franchise still going strong, Toho figured, hey, what about this obvious team up? Let's contrive a reason for Godzilla and King Kong to fight. In this one, a pharmaceutical company wants to boost the ratings of some TV show it's sponsoring. So let's go get a giant monster and put it on display because that usually works out really well. But then things go wrong with that, and Godzilla just happens to pop by, and our human characters do what they always do in these situations. Let them fight. And appropriates some of the worst and most embarrassing of American cultural exports as well. Yeah, so apparently blackface never really went away in Japan, and the natives are in this a lot. Since Kong is scaled up enough to be on par with Godzilla, it does lead to some pretty interesting scale wonk when he gets around to kidnapping a woman. And she seems to vary from roughly like ant size relative to Kong to the 40 foot woman. Yeah, and him kidnapping this lady comes completely out of nowhere and goes nowhere. He just does it because that's what he do. And then she's saved and it's fine. And they make Kong go fight Godzilla for the last 20 minutes and at least they don't do it in a major city. Ahem. Kong appears to win, and then they let him go because... 
Lesson learned from man's hubris? Eh, it's just not worth the trouble. King Kong Escapes was a Japanese-American co-production loosely based on a Rankin and Bass animated series from a few years earlier. In the animated series, Kong befriends a little boy. This version loses that angle, and Kong... <laughs> Oh, <laughs> really? That's what, that's, that's what we're going with. This movie is mostly a setup to get Kong here to battle a Robo-Kong built by a mad scientist named, uh, Doctor Who. No little boy in this version, but uh-oh, a blonde lady, and you know what that means. <laughs> I don't want to go with you! This movie kind of marries the children love Kong thing to the sexualized he wants him some lovin' thing. This was also made during the Godzilla is a friend of the children phase of that franchise, so that definitely influences this Kong in what is one of his more confused portrayals. Kong is a male, and uh, Miss Watson is... Well, see for yourselves, gentlemen. <laughs> Vagina equals laughing. So some bland Americans and one Japanese dude go to Kong Island to study Kong, but they don't get a chance to study him as Doctor Who kidnaps him and turns him into a Hypno-Kong. See, he built a Robot Kong to get Element X, but then Robo Kong failed, and Doctor Who decided to go for the real deal, and then they fight. It's Robo Kong who does the climbing of man's hubris in this one, so I guess that metaphor kind of falls apart. Kong just kind of follows him to get his lady friend back. And although Kong is known for scaling various New York monuments, it has to be said he has by this point scaled a fair portion of Tokyo as well. Ah, the movie that nearly killed Jessica Lange's career in its crib in the same way Star Trek Nemesis nearly killed Tom Hardy's. Yes, I will find a way to work him into anything. A story that doesn't belong in the 70s any more than Captain America did. Everything is wrong and nothing will ever be right again. And I, I think I might love this version. Were you goddamn chauvinist pig ape? This might be the most clumsy update in the history of reboots. Carl isn't a filmmaker, he's an oil man, which is the most 70s things that ever 70s and makes no sense. <laughs> Except I promise you, you'll never get another booking in your life. Said the oil CEO. This group goes to Kong's Island because drill baby drill, but then oil CEO sees Kong and can drive some marketing related reason to take him because it's the 70s and you know, colonialism is kind of dying and so this. Even an environmental rapist like you, even you would be- Oh, not. 70s. Kong climbs not the recently constructed Empire State Building, but the recently constructed Twin Towers, because 70s. And that's the symbol of man's hubris du jour, something something oil, something something stock market. Fine. But trying to sex this movie up is the most bewildering failure. It's like a more boring showgirls. To make sure the allegorical sexuality isn't missed on even the most dense, Kong has a stand-in who does a sexy dance before Anne's sacrifice. It's an animal, a beast, to try to rape you. He risked his life to save me. Try to rape you, honey. Ugh, just what audiences wanted in their King Kong. Thank you, movie. Thanks for that. The movie clearly does not know how to update the gender thing because second wave feminism might give them a frowny face, so this will have to do. You goddamn chauvinist pig ape! Girl power? Dwan is a narcissistic airhead because theme. The movie ends with some dumb non comment about celebrity or something. Is this not what you want, actor lady? Where the 05 remake loves the original maybe too much, this version seems to hate it. It doesn't shy away from the whole rape of the natural world subtext, but it doesn't do anything with it either. I can't decide if I love or hate this version. On the one hand, it sucks. On the other hand, it did give us one of the most frankly wonder terrible, awesome nine additions to the entire Kong legacy. Moving on. Only one thing can save Kong. What's that? A miracle. King Kong Lives has the implied subtitle at the end of the last movie. It even starts with footage from the end of the 76 version. Linda Hamilton plays a doctor who is desperately, desperately trying to save Kong's life for reasons. 
to the point where they engineer this enormous giant artificial heart to save his life because a huge fall equals the hearts, the the problem, ch ch uh, I don't know. But then, out of the random, they find a Lady Kong and some competing university takes her and captures her and takes her back to the States because that went so well the first time. And it's like, yay, we can get a blood transfusion for the dying Kong. So in this one, the man's hubris seems to be, oh no, another institution of learning will have the only other giant ape and that's why man is the real monster. Linda Hamilton does not get conged in the tradition of her lady predecessors. In fact, she doesn't seem to register to him at all. Mostly it's about Kong and she Kong. A huge portion of this movie is just watching a couple of people in monkey suits fuck around. A lot of shots of people in monkey suits looking sad. Somehow or other, they find time to gestate a baby Kong in the runtime of the movie. At the end of King Kong Lives, King Kong dies. Moving on. Visiting hours are over, ma'am. Permanently. So before we get into this one, let's go back to that fake-ass proverb. Note the difference. And lo, the beast looked upon the face of beauty, and beauty stayed his hand. And from that day forward, he was his one day. Nice thing about totally bogus proverbs, you can just change them to fit your meaning. In this case, it supports the premise that Anne Darrow is not a passive beauty, that Kong reacts to, but an active agent that does things, and in this case, befriends him. This is the key difference between this version and the original. That is not to say that it is superior, necessarily. It is just noteworthy. The cliche criticism of this movie is that it's too long, you know, which it is. But really, it's like, at two hours, it would have felt too long. But at three hours, it almost feels too short. Like all post Lord of the Rings Jackson, almost all of the bad comes from Jackson's inability to ever cut anything. And yet, clearly a lot has been cut because there are so many dropped plot threads in this movie. And so much that's just, why is this even here? So much that the movie could have cut except for the scenes between Kong and Anne. Those are great, keep those. Yes, even this one. Whee! because there's so much love in this version. It's kind of awkward, really. Like, Jackson loves everything about the original. He's remaking too much. That's the thing you come to learn about Carl, his unfailing ability to destroy the things he loves. It's both hyper-sincere and kind of meta. Cooper, huh? I might have known. Jesus Christ, it's just so loving. So this movie is kind of worse and better and also kind of worse than earlier versions. For instance, at least it's not like the native see Anne and just inherently know white woman is superior. It's that Anne screams, and that's what makes the Kong happen. And the natives are like, oh, okay, that's what he wants. Let's give him this woman. That said, the natives kind of make me physically ill. Like, at least in earlier versions, they were somewhat humanized. And they are way more humanized and sympathetic in the 30s version. Like, you see them dying and you're like, oh, humans. Humans are sad and dying. They have babies. Here they are so other, they may as well be aliens. But on the other hand, Kong, who is Mo Captain Bits version by Andy Serkis, got dehumaned and is much more overtly a gorilla. Like, sure, like a smart gorilla with pathos, but they drop the sexualized neither beast nor man aspect. He's just a big gorilla. <laughs> and I realize that Peach is a little boy, but honestly, <laughs> thank God. Like, three hour romp about a misunderstood lady and her misunderstood gorilla friend, and they're going wee on the ice in Central Park, and it's weird, but at least you're never really worried that Kong is going to, you know, get handsy. In this version, Beauty is an active participant, which given that she's our protagonist this time, like indisputably, makes the film a lot more compelling. That said, it also makes it a lot less tragic. The thing about the original is that Anne doesn't feel anything for Kong at the end. 
And in the end, he's more interested in petting her than defending himself. And she feels nothing. Who cares? Nobody. Certainly not beauty. But honestly, I still find this character arc for Anne way more compelling since our lead character gets to be something other than a rag doll. And watching a character dynamic grow and change over the narrative is just more gratifying. But I think for everyone's money, maybe just seek out one of those two-ish hour fan cuts instead of this one. There are a couple of non-movie versions that at least merit mention. Did you know that there was, for instance, a musical? Let the night surround you. It was limited to a run in Australia, and although the music wasn't great, and it's pretty easy to poo-poo on the mere idea of a King Kong musical, that animatronic is actually pretty badass. <laughs> and also next year there is a new Netflix series in the works, set in the future in which Kong must save humanity from an army of robot dinosaurs. I kind of wish I had known about that when I chose this topic, or I might have done this later. Anyway, that's it for this episode. You can support this show here, and also that you can help me decide on themes for what my next voting round will be. In this case, I've been getting a lot of requests for X-Men characters, and you know what? It's time to get hype because it Apocalypse is coming out next year, so here are three characters that are slated to appear in that movie. Pick the one that you want me to do. Here is the URL where you can vote, and it's also in the link below. As always, thank you for watching, and always ask permission before foisting your lady friends up any given symbol of man's hubris. Because I'm sitting, sitting on top of the world, way on top, rolling along, I'm rolling along.